Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Word on the Snake Vine. I'm your host Ross Deacon and on this podcast we talk all things about venomous animal related from venom research, venomous animal husbandry, animal conservation, herping and of course snake bite and snake bite initiatives from all around the world. On this episode I have joining me as my co-host. Hi I'm Denny. Hey I'm Squirrel. Hi I'm Med. and before we start I have to do a few formalities. Views expressed in this episode are the views of the guest host, not for the facility or the company they work for. And today we have joining us one of our friends, uh, the, the founder and manager of Venom Tech, Steve Prim. How are you today, Steve? Oh, yeah, doing good. Thanks. Good, good. Is, I hope the weather's as nice down south as it is up north. Uh, no. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's sunny and rainy. We've got the best of both worlds at the moment. Uh, that doesn't seem too bad. So, so I think we'll start at the start. Uh, a lot of people will know you from probably from your your hot sauce, your chili sauce, which we're going to talk about the science behind that later on. I think that's going to be quite interesting for people to to understand where that came from and how that came from. So, kind of, how did you get interested in animals, and how did that develop into uh, into the interest in venom? It's a good question. Um, for me. Even as a kid, the, the natural world around me was a, a great inspiration. And that, uh, to use the words of uh, David Attenborough, that never left. Um, you know, always interested in the, the natural world, animals in the garden. Um, you know, I fondly remember mum helping us rescue a common eel from a drying up pond uh, and then later releasing it. Uh, you know, that sort of in, just general interest in, in wildlife has been a, a, a passion from the beginning, um, ever since I was sort of aware of it, really. Um, and then interest in sort of um, venomous animals really um, came about more uh, as convenient um, because when we're sort of, um, you know, we're quite busy people working a lot and um, we're sort of not around to have, um, you know, high demanding uh, mammals and birds as pets and um, you know, arachnids are uh, much more convenient uh, pets to have. And the sort of fascination came from there. And so what really drives me in my animal passion is that the animals that are different from us. Um, my mum's obsessed by uh, orangutans, but for me, it, it's an obvious that uh, you know, we are, we're share, shared, um, shared distant cousins. Um, and so what really interests me is the animals that are really different, um, particularly the invertebrates, because um, there's, there's a lot to learn a lot of simple stuff we don't know um and then that sort of yeah developed over time really yeah i think a lot of people will know uh, will know a lot of the work you've done is is re- is around about invertebrate venom yeah such forth and i think i think that's where a lot of the bulk of bulk of people will probably know you from so how did that develop into being from just an interest into actually starting to study venoms so there are two independent events really um so what led me into studying venom is um, going through a, uh, a degree. So again, I always had a um, passion for the natural world. It was a, a program, I can't remember the, the date, way, way back, probably definitely in the 80s, by um, David Suzuki talking about the, the human genome. And he had this massive filing cabinet. And if it printed it out, this is what it looked like. And this controls the, the blueprint for life. And from that moment, I was just like, wow, I need to know more about this. So um, I went to Aberystwyth University to study genetics. And um, so then it was really interested in the, the molecular part of life. Um, and also, uh, I managed to do a year out at the Sanger Center actually working on the Human Genome Project, um, which was really cool. Uh, it was a, an amazing experience. Um, and then once I was coming to the end of my degree, I knew that I just wanted to do applied research. My drive was being in the lab, understanding the natural world and how it works. Uh, so I applied for several things, both PhDs and industry. And uh, Pfizer down in uh, Sandwich in East Kent were the, you know, the job that fitted me best in terms of the opportunities they offered and the, the skills they wanted. And so I moved into um, Ramsgate down in uh, East Kent back in 99 to start a job as a, uh, a research scientist at Pfizer. And that took me through 
um, three different teams, uh, which is part of a part of a plan. Uh, did some work studying inflammation, gastrointestinal diseases, tissue repair, and then later settled into uh, pain and neuroscience. Uh, and I was there for about um, probably about eight years studying pain and neuroscience. And the thing with that is the way ion channel signal um, is very complicated, but they also share a lot of common sequence between other ion channels. So designing drugs to cure pain and not stop heart rate or brain signaling is, is very challenging. And it was during this phase where we started to read about venoms, particularly um, therophosid venoms, or people commonly call tarantulas. These venoms actually hit these ion channels quite specifically and it gives you the great opportunity to actually potentially develop a pain medication that has very low side effect profile. And that was my first connection with venoms um, to actually see actually these things have amazing pharmaceutical use. And um, we couldn't really source venom. We could get hold of snake venoms, um, but the invertebrate venoms are really challenging. And that started a, a thinking process because uh, over that time, uh, as I mentioned in the sort of my passion for animals, we've been keeping uh, non-dangerous arachnids as, as pets, several therophosis, a few scorpions. Um, and um, it started sort of, yeah, okay, these things have really fascinating venom. I want to sort of want to know more about what, what's going on here. But also realizing in my professional career that we couldn't actually source the the venoms we were looking for. Um, and, um, and that was without considering the format it was in. Uh, and so after 10 and a bit years working at Pfizer, um, big pharmaceutical restructuring is fairly common, unfortunately. And um, I, I found that career coming to an end. Um, and sort of looking at, okay, what am I going to do now? I, I realized I had three key skills um, that could put together to actually solve a problem that I knew that my colleagues were having. And that was, I understood the venom for its, its biochemistry and pharmacology. Um, that we, were, we had some we were working with, but not many. Um, I'd been keeping non-dangerous um, venomous animals as pets. And I was also the safety officer for the toxins we did have. Um, and therefore, uh, I, uh, these three skills just sort of fell in my lap. And so, crazily enough, within a month of leaving Pfizer, I had incorporated Venom Tech um, and was on the road to, to Venom Research. Uh, and that now was, was about 10 years ago. Yeah, That's, I saw that. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh. Carry on, Ed. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a very interesting way to get into venom research. It's not that kind of normal career path you see of studying venoms, uh, going on to a PhD, then further study, you, you've taken a very different route in. And it, it does reflect in the work that Venom Tech do um, and the, the, the results coming out. Um, I mean, if you could talk a bit, a bit about a bit more, sorry, if you could talk more about what... Um, Venom do as Venom Tech do as a company that'd be great, please. Yeah, so um, and this is something I've um, I see a lot, and I something I put a lot of effort in in the beginning to both show our customers as, as well as everybody else that we are we're having a different approach. So um, my drive is, is the drug discovery; it's the understanding the molecular interactions of what's going on, um, and that's coming from my my background are interested in how molecules control the natural world. Um, and so that, that, um, that focus has, has continued. Um, the collection of venomous animals is merely a, a, a way of doing that. Um, uh, yes, they are you know, fascinating creatures, definitely, but um, it is the drive. When I'm happiest, I'm in the lab seeing what the individual components of the venom do. And so bringing those skills together I um, first went around to see because I'd only kept non-dangerous um, snakes and, and spiders um, up until the beginning of venom tech um, and so the introduction into the world of venomous snake keeping um, and DWA invertebrates for that matter was quite eye-opening <laughs> put it mildly because uh, as you say that I, I'd come uh, as an industrial scientist um, big pharma have Rightly, very rightly so. Very uh, strict and cohesive uh, health and safety approaches. Um, you know, we do work with 
dangerous drugs and um, other dangerous chemicals. So you need the, that safety process in place. And then to come out into a world where I um, met a guy who had a green mamba as his lounge pet, whereas as a kid, we had a budgie, a uh, cockatiel, um, was quite eye-opening. <laughs> Uh, and so this was a, definitely a baptism of fire. Uh, it led me on to, uh, as a team, we patented a safe method of feeding venomous snakes because I'd seen how these people, so that sounds bad, these people, but at that point it was very much a uh, eyes wide open, what the hell's going on sort of situation. Um, where, you know, they're feeding a, a black mamba or a, a, a puff adder or something by opening the enclosure and, and offering it a rat, rat on a pair of tongs. And I was looking at the, the length of the snake and the length of the tongs and going, uh, th- this could be better. <laughs> <laughs> and so using that, that health and safety approach of separation, we just devised a two-way gate system. Um, it works better with a lapid, um, where you could put a two-way gate on the front of the enclosure, open the outside, put the dead food item inside, close the outside, open the inside. And then the first time we fed a black mamba without opening the enclosure was just amazing. It's like, yeah, there's no way that snake could have come out, but it still got its feet. Um, and so that's my, that's where we really stand out because we've come from a different um, uh, appro- approach of you know pharmaceutical health and safety uh, approach to things. But it was quite an exciting ride. Um, but I, I just my approach to business really is you know you've, you've got two options you can either learn stuff or find somebody who knows um and so i sort of seeked out people that had been keeping venomous snakes and clearly had all their digits and hadn't died um and that, that became a criteria for um talking to them to learn more really uh and then it was really eye-opening when we went to uh harm um terrestica to get the first stock for the lab um we already had a few snakes by this point and um i'd looked at uh, a list of things no the list was mostly therophosid spiders um and, and scorpions and on the it will be amazing to get these but surely nobody keeps these as pets we had the black widows brown recluses death stalker scorpions and brazilian wandering spiders and it became quite again another eye-opening moment to go in and find a table with all these in little deli pots. Um, I asked for six um, six black widows, six redbacks, six brown recluses, six Brazilian wandering spiders, um, and I think it was six death stalkers in there as well. And uh, they just put them in a carrier bag and said, "Yes, that's so many euros." Um, <laughs> so that, that was that was a new adventure. And to, to then get them back in the lab and build. The, uh, put the safe working practice in, into action um, where we actually using CO2 to anaesthetize particularly Brazilian wandering spiders for husbandry routine um, it means they're then, they're then safe um, so this is the sort of foundation of what we do and our first papers were all around novel approaches to, to animal husbandry showing that we have a, um, a different approach because if you look on YouTube about venomous animals there is plenty of mavericks out there showing you the, the crazy way of, of how not to do things. And this actually you know, generally gets more attention than others. And what I didn't want is our customers, the large pharmaceutical industry, who are very health and safety conscious, thinking that we were in that group. So it put a lot of effort into that, that safe working practice. And, it, and it's shown dividends, um, both through papers and reputation in the beginning. So... Most of what we do there is extracting the venoms um, in a, you know, using a safe working practices uh, and then characterizing the venom. So we look at how much protein's in there, separate those proteins out into the individual component and put them into uh, 384L or 96L assay plates. And this means from our customer's point of view, and our customers are quite twitchy about the uh, the animal side of things in terms of dangerous animals. Um, when I built my first, well, I built my first website. That's a bit of a lie. I had my first website built. Um, the animals were very prominent because obviously they're the product. And um, I asked the, you know, a few ex-colleagues of mine what they thought. And they said it was great. But I later realized they answered a different question to what I'd asked. And 
they answered the, what do you think about me setting up a business, which they said was great. I actually wanted to know what they thought of the website. And it was an eye-opening conference, uh, which would have been 2011, I think, where one of my customers, it was sort of, well, they weren't customers at the time, which sort of leads were just having a chat. Um, and they said, you know, it's fascinating what you do. We want to know more about the Venoms. We had a chat. And they said, but your website's quite scary. And so that was an eye-opening position of you don't want to be scaring your customers away from, uh, from, from talking to you. So that moment, okay, we stripped all the animal images out of the, uh, out of the website because our, our customers want a compound uh, to actually study for, um, for drug research. Uh, and so that's where the, the focus is. And that's why when you come to our website, there are, you know, there are, there's a couple of animal images subtly hidden and around. Um, but it's not the main focus. The main focus of what we do is the, the molecules themselves and how they interact in a, in a drug-like way. Um, and so that's the, you know, the bulk of what I do, uh, particularly in the lab, is um, looking at the individual venoms, separating them out, and targeting them to fit the right disease areas. So we're looking at um, venoms that have uh, anti-cancer agents, we do, we've got two PhD students just finishing off now that have been doing anti-cancer research. Um, we also uh, look at, it's still uh, a lot in pain and neuroscience. A lot of our customers are doing that sort of work. Um, we also look at uh, antibacterial activity of venoms um, and very recently some antiviral activity. So we've got some hot off the press data showing okay. venoms that block COVID-19 binding to the um, ACE2 receptor which is quite exciting stuff uh, yes exactly and that's what really drives me it's that seeing that new pharmacological activity of a venom um that is not been known or published before uh that, that's the real exciting thing for me and there's still a world of it to actually um to discover there's oh indeed so we are just done. scratching the surface now we've got a collection of about 200 species um, but it's out of a couple of hundred thousand uh, venomous species. Um, and you know, some of our other students are actually uncovering new venomous animals um, and uh, new ways of extracting those venoms uh, that uh, one of our recent um, graduates, but technically hasn't graduated, but has finished. <laughs> <laughs> It, yeah, due to COVID-19, it's not graduated. Um, but uh, yeah, Steve Baxter was worked with us to actually discover uh, a new venomous amphibian, uh, which we're in the process of, of writing that paper, which is um, very cool indeed. So um, yeah, we're sort of just sort of scratching the surface, but our venom collection is um, very diverse, both biogenetically and geographically. Uh, and that's because I need a diverse compound library underneath it. So whereas other venom collections have larger numbers of, of fewer species um, for, you know, typically the anti-venom, the people producing venoms for anti-venom need volume, um, whereas we need diversity. Most of the venom we sell, you can't really see. Uh, it's so tiny in the, typically in a few hundred nanograms. Yeah, I was, I was just looking months. at your... Uh... I was just looking at your, the list on your website of available venoms. It, it's pretty comprehensive. There's a well, there's a lot, there's a lot on there. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. Arachne, the spider side. Holy moly! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the uh, and uh, you know, people when we get visitors to the lab, um, in, in terms of sort of uh, you know, professional contacts and stuff, they always go, "Oh, we'd love to see a black widow," and then go like, "Oh, that's really tiny." <laughs> But yeah, they are really tiny. They don't need to be big. <laughs> um, we get that when we uh, tour people around LSTM and they see, for example, uh, an echis species. Yes. Yeah. They start talking to them about it representing probably the deadliest snake species yeah, yeah. in the world. And then, what, you mean that little thing? Yeah. 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 <laughs> that little thing can really ruin your day. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, and, yeah that's quite fascinating. I mean, we, it was hilarious the other day. We had some... Um, engineers doing some work in the lab next door and uh, we've got a framed spider skin out in the office which we lovingly call boris um for any who fans out there um and uh they, they were absolutely fascinated by it and i'm trying to work out what they were doing they were just just nosing and um 
And they looked and went, and I was like, are all those boxes spiders? And they went, yeah. They went, so you're okay with spiders then? Like, well, yeah. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have built this just to scare myself. <laughs> but it, uh, it, it does amuse me of what people are scared of. Um, so many times people say that the spiders are more scary than the snakes are. But in an open space, uh, uh, a black neck spitting cobra or a mamba is far more scary than any of the spiders we have. I think it's a proxy, have... isn't it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. The, the, um, they've definitely come into contact with more spiders than they have snakes. Yeah, exactly. We yeah. have um, three transders in the herbarium just because oh. um, we don't use anything. We don't do anything with them. They're just... We have the pets. perfect environment. Just pets, yeah. 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 <laughs> we have them and like most reptile people we like more than just reptiles so we've got yeah. three in the aquarium yeah, nice. and um, they're just hidden at the back and when you're taking people on tours you'll explain like we've got snakes here if you're scared you don't have to come in the room and you point out and like everyone's peering in boxes and you say oh we've got three spiders dotted about you can't see them because they're all hidden away and people back off very <laughs> quickly <laughs> yeah it's, it is uh, absolutely fascinating that uh, irrational fear thing uh, it's something I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated with because I don't I've never suffered it. I don't, you know, it, when you're in an open space with a uh, with a tiger or something like that, then that'll be scary. But if it's behind bars or a picture, I don't, yeah, I don't see how that's a, a problem. So people, you know, I used to work with um, a scientist who um, couldn't look at the image of a of a spider. Um, and now back then, you know, advisor. I work in a lab, I didn't mix with the customers or public, so jeans and T-shirt were general dress. And obviously having a, an interest in spiders every now and again, I'd have a T-shirt with a spider on it, and to me, I wouldn't wouldn't think about it. Um, but when I had a meeting with this particular scientist, she had to stand to the side with her hand up <laughs> against her eyes because she couldn't look at my T-shirt. And I d <laughs> it would just amaze me. It was hilarious. I think I might be able to one-up that one. Um, <laughs> our finance department moved up to the third floor of LSTM, um, basically bordering uh, the office that Paul and I share, and then the herbarium's in it, just across this lobby area. We've got a big glass window, so you can see into the procedure room and watch us. Yeah. Um, when finance moved up, uh, one of the, the ladies who works in there is petrified of snakes. Even if we stood outside of the procedure room, there's no snakes, she has to cover the side of her face and... She will not look through the window, and she has to walk past it every day to get in and out of the lift. <laughs> is that the snake, or is that you and Paul? <laughs> I'm I'm sorry, in that. It's me and Paul, actually. <laughs> not the snakes anymore. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> it was just that conditioning you, you just associated with the snake, so yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately so. For once, <laughs> being recognised for snakes is not actually the best thing. No. <laughs> So, other than the pharmaceutical side of it, with kind of looking into um, venom peptide, are there any other fields that might benefit from looking into drug discovery that aren't necessarily associated with drug discovery? Yeah, so there's a few things we've discovered along the way, actually, and it's led, led us into fascinating areas of, of research and uh, just sort of generally from you know having these fascinating animals and, and studying them um i found myself chairing the veterinary invertebrate society um because we have a you know for obvious reasons a, a great interest in um arachnid health and we want to actually make sure that the you know, the animals are, are are fit and healthy but also you know the uh the evolution of venom systems and um the venomous animals themselves so we do a little bit of not as much as I'd like actually looking into the, the, the taxonomy of the venomous animals. Um, but one area that has fascinated me, and it's, it's partly a customer drive. I spend a lot of time um, talking to my customers about this. Um, and I've written a, recently written a, uh, a lab news article that's published last month, I think, um, about the, the evolution of venom. And it's not anthropocentric. People think that, um, why would you use venoms? Because they've not, you know, they've clearly not evolved to, um, cure human disease and that's very true um however the targets they have evolved to hit in in their prey or predators have also evolved in humans as well but 
one of the things that is a an interesting line of research, but it's been going, it's, it's taken us a long time because it's been a, a sideline project for all the people involved, is actually um, studying venoms and finding out they've got antimicrobial activity. It was a case of, well, why have they evolved to kill bacteria? Um, you know, some people say about the venomous animals having um, poor immune systems, and that's possible, but the more we learn about their immune systems, um, the more the less likely that is. Uh, and it was a chance encounter with um, uh, another um, ex-Pfizer scientist who, um, Asterios Mostros up at uh, Northumbria University, um, actually saying, well, what if the venom gland has a microbiome? What, what if these antimicrobial peptides are there because there is bacteria in the venom gland? And between the two of us, we had the, the expertise to, to investigate this. Uh, and sure enough, we um, could grow several species, but we actually uh, whole genome sequenced um, the, the bacteria from the venom and found a whole range of species, uh, some of which that actually had um, various expression cassettes for detoxifying venom protein, proteins, um, things like um, the pathway of, of basotracine defense which we think is there to, to protect themselves against the antimicrobial peptides. So there's an a, a evolutionary arms race going on within the venom gland. And for me, that was fantastic because it's a, it's a great example of how um, drug discovery and the discovery of antimicrobial peptides has influenced what we understand about venoms and venom evolution. Um, and there's several examples where we've got drug discovery um, target effects of venoms that I really want to go back and look and say, okay, what's the evolutionary significance of this? Um, and one of those is we did some work with Oxford University, their Structural Genomics Consortium, um, where we actually found some venoms that are affecting epigenetic pathways that are actually sort of master regulators of, of um, gene uh, transcription. And I'd love to know what what these venom are, are doing from an evolutionary point of view. Is it just serendipitous they hit other targets and just happen to hit this as well, or is is there a unknown genetic mechanism um, for venoms that we just don't understand yet? Um, and so this is a um, a constant distraction from <laughs> the core <laughs> business of <laughs> selling venom for drug discovery. Um, however, you know, producing scientific publications about venoms and venomous animals is all good for business. It helps raise the profile of the company. Um, it plays the, the lottery of getting a name in more places and more chance of people finding it. So it is something we, you know, we actively uh, pursue, mainly through collaborations. Um, if it's uh, not directly relevant to a, um, a venom pharmacology. Sorry, I thought uh, I thought uh, Squirrel was going to uh, pipe up then. <laughs> okay, yeah, no worries. I thought it was, it's okay. I thought I'd just been talking to myself. But oh, right. <laughs> that does happen sometimes. It's fascinating it's, stuff. It's really all fascinating stuff. stuff. The mute was not the host's friend either. We we've got a thing where we all hit mute while the person yeah. talking, and then we start talking, or and we're still on mute sometimes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's easily done. Yeah, it becomes a becomes a bit of a nightmare at times. Bit of incident. <laughs> so do you have any other cool projects that uh, you've got coming up or research lined up that you can tell us about as well because i think this is it's quite interesting to hear about the different projects you've you've been involved in and, and continuing to do yeah we've got a whole host of things coming on my list of papers in progress is probably twice as long as my list of papers that are published <laughs> so um, we've got a lot of stuff going on uh, several book chapters being written uh, at the moment, mostly in um, drug discovery side of things. Um, I've got a book chapter on arachnid histology um, that is in the later stages of um, being ready for print. And that was absolutely amazing um, to actually look at the internal anatomy. Um, so one of the things we do at Venom Tech is when an animal dies for whatever reason, 
um, we preserve in alcohol. Uh, and that's because primarily that the taxonomy is always changing. And so, and also drug discovery projects are really long. So venoms that we've sold you know, six, eight years ago um, could still be an active project. Um, we then might need to clarify the actual uh, organism afterwards to we'll actually go back and work to it from that. But it also gives us a great resource for, for studying and looking at um, how the um, the nerves work. And obviously having a background in, in pain research, uh, I'm fascinated about how spiders um, perceive their, their world, the sensory and, and pain processing. Um, and so, you know, there's a, an area there that uh, there's a paper in uh, in the process of being written that we worked with the veterinary and vertebrate society on um just trying to think of the, what else what have we got to go on uh we're doing quite a bit on jellyfish you may have heard of <laughs> quite, yeah we, we, we've heard, heard of that one we, we may have heard of that one yeah, yeah. Well, somebody, may have, that. <laughs> somebody <laughs> may have mentioned that yeah um, but I think I think this is quite a good, probably a good point that um, just to mention. Otherwise, our listeners may may not twig that um, yeah. Squirrel is working with Steve as part of his his uh, MSC. His, his master's. Yeah, indeed. Yes, uh, yeah. he was uh, foolish enough to suggest he was interested in <laughs> <laughs> doing a postgraduate degree, um, <laughs> and uh, was talking to us about options and ideas. Uh, obviously, geographically, it's not very convenient, but. Uh, uh, <laughs> Otherwise, there was a, a, a direct mesh of uh, a fascination for venoms. We were wanting to get into um, understanding Nidarian venoms better. Uh, and um, it was something that Phil, Phil knew about. So, um, yeah, we were delighted to have him on board. And uh, we'll be uh, yeah, push, pushing him to get the best thesis possible out the back end of it. But, uh, yep. uh, yeah, it's a fascinating project. And and I, and I think there's there's probably a lot of discovery there that hasn't been done or as as well, isn't it? As you say, it's kind of a new field for you, but it's also quite an un, an undisco uh, well an under understudied field in general as well. Yeah, definitely. And same with um, most venomous species that the major research has been done on treating the human pathology as a result of envenomation. And that's the same with Nidarians. So there's you know, a lot out there on the box jellyfish and, and um, uh, other similar organisms like Portuguese man of war because they cause significant human pathology. But understanding the you know, the biology of the of beadlet anemones and um, moon jellyfish, um, it has really not much much been done. So it's really a fascinating area. Um, I think the first sort of drug discovery mention of, of a Nidarian venom was, was not till the 90s in the mid 90s at that i think um so yeah it's it's uh, fascinating and something I've, I've found all the way through venom tech that there is people have asked questions of you know, oh, you know what about this venom you know that might, might be a silly question but often it's not a silly question because nobody else has actually asked it yeah uh and so it leads us off into really um fascinating areas and one of the things i do want to look more into is um the true bugs as well. Um, nice. Somebody mentioned to me that uh, they've got a suspicion that water boatmen are venomous. Uh, and this is from anecdotal bite report. I was like, yeah, could do that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they're easily accessible. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, and then we've got a wonderful collaboration with Oxford Brooks University and Anna Nakaris. Uh, looking at the venoms of, of slow lorises, and um, I certainly never knew, never even considered primates as being a venomous species. Uh, I mean, yeah, when she did the episode, she mentioned that there might be a few other species that are venomous that we just haven't done any study, any field of study in yet. So, kind of the piece of work that you guys are doing there could be quite interesting to see what comes out of that. Yeah, exactly, and um, you know. Shrews have been known to be venomous for a while, but there's like, I think there's about three proteins in Uniprot from shrews. Um, now, their, their genomes, turns out they don't actually have many venomous proteins. They're quite unusual in having quite simple venoms. Um, but even so, they're still quite, uh, quite fascinating. Obviously, the uh, selenodons are amazing. There was a great paper recently on uh, selenodon venoms, um, a creature I've never, never seen in the flesh, but 
um, that, that's quite cool so yeah there's there's loads of interesting areas we're sort of getting into and finding out just as um things pop up um we're, we're doing more work also on um understanding how uh the microbiome might be distributed throughout the spiders now we've got a um we're still trying to close out the original um paper it's it's available in, in preprints but we're obviously trying to get it finally published there's a few more work in that but also looking at the you know, microbiome of, of healthy spiders and this connects us with um the veterinary vertebrate society of when you've got a pathology um it sort of look like you know it looks like an infection or something you take a swab and that's all great but if you don't know what's normal you've got nothing to compare it to um, this yeah and these, these just basic things are not done we we um published a paper last year maybe from a year before on the basic baseline biochemistry parameters of, of hemolymph in spiders again because that had never been done so when we find something uh, unusual from a pathology point of view there's nothing to compare it to um so there's there's a whole ream of just sort of baseline normal things that for mammalian pets are, are well characterized but when you get into uh, reptiles and arachnids they're, they're just not there yeah the, the entire field of, of kind of veterinary field with invertebrates is hugely kind of under underutilized as then it? it's very kind of scarce that you see a vet that has a good understanding of um, what what could be wrong with like pet in vet as far as it goes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and it's 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 twofold. It's one getting vets that are willing to see them. Um, the the rare moments I've taken spiders into vet um, it has split the. Uh, staff population <laughs> <laughs> between those that are absolutely fascinated and glued to you and those that have suddenly made a quite a distance <laughs> yeah. especially if you're bringing in uh, like brazilian wandering spiders and stuff to vets that would uh yeah we've I, been, I, we've I assume you don't have to do that, that. <laughs> yeah no. um and now with um so chairing the veterinary vertebrate society it's a lot easier uh, the vets generally come to us because they want to study our <laughs> us, our um population um, but in the early days, um, I would read a few things about CO2 as being um, an anesthetic agent in, in arthropods um, and also people using uh, isoflurane, more sort of standard uh, organic anesthetic. Um, and so we actually arranged with our local vet to take a, a spider and a scorpion in and put them under isoflurane anesthesia to see how that, excuse me, to see how that works and how that behaved relative to the, the co2 system that we uh, already started with and yeah that was funny that I had a, there was a uh, a vet and a couple of nurses absolutely fascinated and uh, a similar number of people <laughs> suddenly had to do something far far away <laughs> <laughs> so um kind of whilst we're on the, the spider kind of theme yeah um you you've got the chili sauce, which I think Ross mentioned earlier, um, that's kind of your side project, I guess, isn't it? To bridge science and food. Do you want to kind of explain a bit about the science behind the, the chili sauces that you've got and maybe um, plug away where, where you can get them as well? Yeah, cool. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. It's um, <laughs> something I never thought I would be doing. <laughs> um, it never occurred to me, and when it was when the idea was first put to me, I thought it was proper bonkers. Um, <laughs> and so there's a great a great story behind this that I was asked to do a, a presentation of local business leaders, part of the Institute of Directors, um, and to be able to explain to a group of non scientists why I. I put a collection of venomous animals together uh, for drug discovery. Um, I sort of thought, okay, well, what can I do? And I looked, well, okay, well, well the venue is actually um, McNaid Fine Foods that, that were hosting it. Uh, and the, the MD there, Stefano, was the, the guy hosting the meeting. And I was like, okay, well, we know some venoms activate trip B1, which is the receptor that binds capsaicin, the hot component of chilies. It also detects thermal pain uh, in humans. It's the reason you lift your hand off the off the stove. Um, and so I thought, okay, 
I'll, I can keep a theme in here and to talk about capsaicin chili as, as a, a neurotoxin, which is exactly what it is, um, how it binds to a receptor and causes a signal, and that signal goes to the brain, and the, the brain goes, that's pain, deal with it, and, and process it. Um, and then, okay, so here you've got a, a molecule from a chili pepper that binds to a receptor, causing a signal. Here you've got a molecule from a spider. Yes, it's a different shape. It's a, a protein rather than a, a small molecule alkaloid. Um, and it actually binds to the same receptor in a slightly different way, but causes the same signal. And so that signal is, is burning pain. So therefore, the bite from the, the Trinidad Chevron spiders probably are my favorite spiders, and it's partly because of this pharmacology. Um, that actually a bite from them would feel like an injection of Tabasco sauce. Um, you know, it's clearly there for predator defense. Uh, any mammalian predator getting a bite from one of these spiders is going to remember that that's not a good thing to tangle with. And then I took this going on to that there's other receptors that do other things and other venom proteins that bind to them and that went into more, you know, the sort of that device drug discovery which we've been talking about. And after, the, uh, after my presentation, Stefano came up to me and went, we really need to make a venom chili sauce. <laughs> and I went, that's a silly idea. <laughs> you don't want to put venom in food. He went, no, they'd love it. And I was like, okay. Um, I'm not sure how we'd say we're not a food company. Um, but clearly they were. Um, and it just seemed a bit too, too bonkers for, for a couple of reasons. One is getting a food-grade venom. It's not impossible. It's definitely doable. But the other scale, um, uh, as I said before, we, we sell venom in nanograms. Um, and you're going to, if you for uh, a That's supermarket so chili sauce, you're going to need a hell of a lot of venom. <laughs> and the world's large collection of uh, Trinidad Chevron spiders. Um, and basically, he didn't let it lie. <laughs> it's what happened. Um, every time I bumped into Stefano, he's like, oh, we really need to do this. Um, and okay, eventually gave in and went, how, okay, how are we going to do this? Um, so he phoned up the food standards agency and said, what would it take to put venom in the food? And, um, I was amazed by the response. They didn't say, go away, you're mental. Don't do <laughs> Uh, it was very pragmatic. There's a, a, a straightforward set of, um, basically toxicological experiments you need to do to bring something into the human food chain that's not been there already. Um, which as a consumer, it's really reassuring to see that's there. But that was, um, you know, 10,000 pounds plus worth of, of experimental work, um, which we weren't really willing to do for a chili sauce because we weren't going to make that money back because people <laughs> weren't going to pay uh, several hundred pounds a bowl yeah, yeah. for a bottle of chili sauce. Um, so we then took it apart and went, okay, if the chili acts like venom, Therefore, the venom act like chili. Uh, and so it became venom-inspired chili sauce. Um, and we agreed to do it as a company because it's a great branding exercise. It's a great opportunity to get venom science out to people who wouldn't have thought about it before. And although most of them are not our target audience, there are likely to be some that are. And I've definitely been to conferences where... Uh, people we want to talk to have known me from from doing the chili sort. Um, and so we then sort of went to some third party providers to find a chili sauce that fitted the 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 plan of what we wanted to to achieve. And we just picked the best one we liked uh, out of that lot. Um, and then one quiet morning, I was getting a train into London for a conference, which was a fairly fairly normal thing for me to be doing. Um, was hoping to get some time on the train to actually uh, plan who I was going to talk to at the conference and the, the talks to visit and so on and so forth. And my phone rang and it was my mum saying, did you know you're in the Daily Mail? I was like, no, <laughs> I probably should. <laughs> and it was about the the, uh, the chilli sauce. And we had put out a press release, but I hadn't realised exactly where it had gone. Um uh, and yeah, you because know, you put up these things, and sometimes they get picked up, and sometimes they just float about in the ether and disappear. Um, and then, shortly followed by a phone call from Stefano, and then my phone was just red hot for the entire trip. Um, and the 
venom chili sauce had been picked up by lad bible and got like 15,000 shares in an afternoon and it suddenly went crazy and we just yeah the demand was far in excess of anything that we could produce because we were making it in a a boutique farmhouse kitchen um in east kent uh and so that that was absolutely crazy um something i just never never predicted and and never thought we'd be involved with but as a as a story it it's great to actually share venom science with a a a wider audience um in january this year there was a um european society of animal cell culture meeting and i gave the after dinner speak uh i'll try and get that worded better (laughs) I gave, <laughs> I gave the after dinner speech um, as I was invited to talk about the science behind venom chili sauce um, and uh, to a scientific audience, which was absolutely brilliant. And we had tasters of the sauce there at the same time. Um, so that, that was really cool. Um, the only negative feedback we get is from the people doing the sort of chili competitions that it's not hot enough. Um, and having an understanding of pharmacology to me that's just a, a gauntlet being thrown down um we are going to use the pharmacology of um of venoms and and synergy to actually um explain how multiple pathways are additive together to make a, a super hot version uh, at some point in the future but and this this will be made at a, a bottling plant scale so there'll be a much bigger um distribution and uh, supply of that because at the moment we are we are sold out of salt uh, it is clearly <laughs> even in covid19 lockdown people have seen it as an essential supply <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is awesome um so it has been on sale at mcnade fine foods obviously they were the, the instigators of this idea in the past um i'm very pleased that uh, lee at the spider shop uh, if anybody knows him has been uh, mail ordering our uh, chili sauce to uh, those that, that will. And it's in a few zoo gift shops as well. But um, yeah, the, the future for us will be doing it in a, uh, a larger scale such that we can cope with the demand because um, when it came, it was enormous and we just couldn't deliver it. We had people from Texas um, saying that they wanted 15 cases as a test run. <laughs> but that. that more than we've ever made in the first place. <laughs> hey, the, the Americans love that type of food, don't they? As well, and that yeah, their so, sauce is so. Yeah, and there's a great YouTube I mean, video of a couple of guys. They actually, um, over the course of the, it's only about five, three or five minute video. They just do shots of our sauce, just <laughs> one after the other, just <laughs> talking about it, and they got some really good comments. Because, <clears> yeah, it's not blowing your head off. I can really see why you'd you'd want this, uh, which is really great. But I don't quite see and they did a whole bottle between the two of them over a sort of nice. three minutes <laughs> <laughs> which is hilarious yeah. the, the extra hot version that i've tried a prototype of is uh it's even nicer and that's saying something because it's nice anyway but like <laughs> taste wise it is it is good yeah that is um i gave it to one of my fr- sri lankan friends and they went oh that's really nice and i went yeah that needs to be hotter <laughs> <laughs> This is, it's this it's fantastic to be, outreach for uh, slap in the face. Sorry. Yeah, a little, but the outreach that you've got off the back of that is is phenomenal. Phenom- I can't even say it, but is <laughs> incredible. Um, the, the lengths that, uh, especially within venom research, you go to to try and get that public engagement. Yeah. All it takes is some well-made chili sauce, apparently. Yeah, and uh, something that we they never suspected, and it was. Stefano just basically wearing me down with this crazy idea. Um, and I'm really glad he did. It was really uh, exciting stuff. And we should definitely be doing more of it in the future because it is a, uh, it's a great story. It's great for um, getting us known in the, in, in the wider world. Uh, there was a, a funny radio interview we shipped a bottle up to um, somewhere in Ireland. I can't remember now, unfortunately now. And they clearly pick the person with this lowest chili tolerance <laughs> <laughs> as, as the person to try it live on air, which was very funny. <laughs> the the conversations that it will start is fantastic. And the, the recognition that you're getting for it as well is invaluable to your company. Um, yes, definitely. I do want to bring us back slightly when you were talking about um, working alongside veterinary societies for invertebrates. 
and um, how you've constantly tried to improve the, the husbandry. Um, within Benham Research, it, it's very difficult for space, obviously, especially with larger animals. Um, have you found any um, kind of quantifiable data that comes off the back of improved welfare of the animals, uh, for example, in the toxins, the quality of the the, uh, the product? Yes, yeah, so it's more around yield um, is where we've made improvements with husbandry. Um, and that's come in in two ways. Um, one is with the um, the snake gate, so the, the safe method of feeding venomous snakes, is that previously when you opened an enclosure, um, you could be opening that enclosure to, to feed the animal, take it out for extractions or clean it out. And ultimately, the feeding and cleaning have got a high, higher um, frequency than the other two. Um, and so what you get, particularly with spitting cobras, is when you open the box, you get a, a spitting reaction, and therefore that's, that's venom lost. Whereas with the feeding gate system, they only fed through the gate. So when you opened the box, they were a bit more quizzical. It's a bit anthropomorphic, but it wasn't a full-on attack, oh, I'm going to get fed uh, approach. So we, we'd save venom there. Um, with the theraphosis, where we do most of our research, um, or in arachnids in general, and there's a good reason for that, and it's it comes down to yield. Um, you don't need a cobra to be fully on its game to get more venom than you can possibly use in a particular experiment. Um, whereas with some of the spiders and particularly some of the small scorpions, every percentage increase makes a big difference. Oh, we've got scorpions that we get nanoliters of venom out of. Um, whereas we've got cobras, obviously very familiar with, you can get a mill out of, um, which is actually uh, crazy. Uh, and so uh, improving um, environmental enrichment has been beneficial. Uh, we, we had a paper on that. Uh, back in 2011, I think that was, um, where we actually had to set the baseline. So we had to actually work out what was um, normal and aggressive postures in, in theraphosids because that just that had not been done. So going back to the needing to do the baseline first. And then we had an enriched enclosure with, um, we were using plastic leaves. It you know, they looked nice, but the, the reality of it, they were a cheap, cleanable 3D matrix. And I think that's really what it comes down to with arboreal spiders. We were looking at the um, Trinidad chevrons, the uh, Samopius cambridgii, and the Indian ornamentals, uh, Postelotheria regalis. And when you're giving them a complex 3D space, in this case it was plastic leaves and upright hide, you get a much calmer spider. And we actually saw an increase in, in venom yield uh, connected with, with that. that. So it made them easier to work with, but also uh, uh, they earn their keep better. Um, several species are upgrading the size of the water bowl and the humidity in the enclosure has a, um, a direct impact in, in um, venom yield as well. And that's uh, work we're in the process of writing. It's one of the many papers we're in the process of writing up. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely um, improvements, and it's not always obvious. You think you're doing the, you know, the best for the animals. They are... Um, Doing, doing well and breeding well and not showing stereotypical behaviours and these sorts of things. Um, but you can tweak the, um, the environmental conditions and actually uh, increase the venom yield. In terms of quality, what we generally find is that, and I think this is an evolutionary thing, that the venom they produce is always effective. Um, the actual peaks of individual components do, do change and differ in, in certain conditions. But generally, um, it is very um, re relatively consistent. But we do get increases in yield with improvements in, in husbandry, particularly for arachnids, which is our main main area where we've done this research. Well, that's uh, fantastic that you are getting these results, and especially with yield. Um, you mentioned in snakes, we have the luxury of working in effectively much larger yields than you do. And even then, we're, we're trying to always improve our methods to get higher yields and so they're valuable for us when you're working in nanograms those in incremental increases are, are as you've said so important yeah definitely you know, for us 
a, um, an average um, spitting cobra yield gave you sort of three or four hundred mg dry weight protein um, when you're putting that down to assay plates of 200 nanograms it goes a hell of a long way <laughs> for sure um, I mean we one of our uh, black neck spitting cobras averages about 500 mg yeah. of dried we've had over 700 mg off one extraction yeah, yeah they're and fantastic that, creatures and that itself for each extraction you've got such a huge stockpile and then when people come to take little bits out 10 micrograms is is seen as a standard amount out of yeah. 700 per extraction for example so we can build a stockpile very easily but conversely for you every bit of extra yield must be so nice to achieve yeah and we've, we've done um a reasonable amount of work and, and more coming actually on uh, british spiders as well um and when, when you start looking at those for, for yields uh, it is definitely a microscope job to see the venom <laughs> How would you go about drying uh, the venom at that size? Uh, obviously, it being freeze dried is is a standard, but then processing the venom after it's dried in such small amounts. So um, we freeze dry it in the same way we freeze dry everything else. Um, just a, um, you know, a straightforward lyophilization instrument. Ours has got multiple shelves in it, so uh, it's built to hold plates, uh, assay plates rather than vials. Uh, but otherwise, it's a fairly standard bit of kit. Um, to dry venom at that yield, if you just put it in the sealed tube in the freezer, it will freeze dry itself. You'll find the water condensed on the lid and the, the venom dried on the side of the tube. The, the most important thing when you've got venoms of that size is controlling electrostatic interactions. Um, the dry venom is uh, electrostatic. Um, so if you're using polypropylene tubes, they can build up a charge when they're going in and out of the racks and it is discharging that charge before you actually then go and, and open the tube to, to work with it is one of those one of those key uh, sort of insider tips i would say um and it's that's something we always say to our, our customers that when they get the um array plates they are heat sealed um such that the venom doesn't stick to the seal uh, rather than it. and um, always say if they do have an anti-static map it's worth discharging it before opening the lid because when you're working with venoms that are so so small you can't see them you can't tell if they're there or not that's yeah really, uh, that's really quite sorry. interesting you don't realize how little as you say how little yields some animals will give yield wise and that that's uh for a lot of our listeners, they may not understand what that actually means in as regards to uh, the amount of the amount in weight. Uh, yeah. So uh, the the best way of describing it is um, some of our small scorpions will their total yield from an individual scorpion will be about the size of the root of one of your hairs. <laughs> so yeah. If you pluck a hair out and look at the tiny white dot on the end. That is an acceptable venom yield for some of the species we work with. You can always just buy gallons of it from uh, from the Middle East. <laughs> yes, yes. There, there seems to be pyramids selling, selling the scorpion venom going on in the Middle East. We, we also uh, get our fair share of people offering scorpion venom to us at a snake bite research <laughs> centre. Yeah. yeah, do you get people say, oh, I've got black scorpion venom for sale. Like, what species is it? Uh, black. Okay. We had a gentleman <laughs> turn into the, uh, LSTM apparently with venom on him, and uh, just turned <laughs> up saying he's got venom to sell us from scorpions. Um, <laughs> Luckily, security not had that. us up, and um, well, we're not really sure what to do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, we've had that. Um, also, I think it's a, a language thing. But we've had a guy that sounded like he was trying to sell us a five hundred gram scorpion. Uh, five hundred gram scorpion is impressive. Yeah. No, I thought we had a lobster. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Makes but, you wonder what the venom is. <laughs> yeah, but my, my team uh, thinks that you know, this is a, a completely new thing to science and he's completely frustrated as to why nobody actually believes him. <laughs> like he really found the world's largest scorpion. A legitimate scorpion at the top of it. Yeah. <laughs> nobody believes him, which would be amazing. Um, we have had some, I've had some crazy requests over the years. Um, 
we keep them uh, anonymously, obviously, from, for GDPR. But uh, we, we, we are thinking of uh, eventually writing a book of the, <laughs> the crazy, crazy requests we've had uh, over the years. Um, one, a few that stand out to me were um, by an email. Have you got some less lethal Viper venom that I can inject myself with? Um, that, that was quite interesting. <laughs> um, loads of people trying to sell us scorpion venom. Um, and uh, yeah, just just we seem to just have a a flag up for um, crazy people, for want of a better phrase. I couldn't think of a politically correct way of putting it. But people just obsessed with with venom and needing to be a part of it and not having any clue as to what it actually involves and what's going on. And also get a list of people that um, just send us a one line email. Have you got any jobs? <laughs> I, I mean that, that's the best way to go that. about it I'm not going to answer that <laughs> uh, it does attract some interesting uh, people to contact you and it's actually made me feel better about the first time I spoke to uh, got in contact with Steve was asking for I think it was 52 grams of Jameson venom yeah, that yeah. were requested so now I don't feel so bad <laughs> no that wasn't <laughs> uh, an insane request <laughs> yeah no that wasn't wasn't crazy I've had um, back on the chili sauce, somebody said, uh, "Could you provide us with a bowl full of venom and a bowl full of chili sauce that we can try them side by side?" <laughs> so we sportingly sent them a quote for a bowl full of spider venom, and they didn't really go back to us. <laughs> I can imagine how much that would cost. The cost of it, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> had lots of zeros in it. <laughs> if they agreed to it, though, you would have probably been able to retire and uh, move, to, yeah. move yeah. to the the. the uh, Caribbean coast in Costa Rica or somewhere. Yeah, yeah it's like... Can you imagine trying to source that many salmopius? Yeah. <laughs> they breed pretty, uh, pretty readily. So, but um, yes, it would have been mental. But uh, it was just like, yeah, you've got no idea how this works. <laughs> Usually, when you tell them the price for a nanogram or a, a microgram, that's suddenly when it dawns. I've found it's, it's when they realise the actual money worth for the amount you get. Uh, that moment, you you quickly lose a lot of interest. Yeah, we've had somebody um, ask about a purified toxin, which on the face of it looked like a very reasonable request. They said, oh, probably only want about uh, just a small amount of 100 megs to start off with. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I might be able to purified purified toxin. toxin from the spider venom. It's like, I might be able to provide you that, but... In about a year of work. It's yeah. going to get through a lot of uh, venom. Um, which you have to pay for to get through. And that does just turned out to be a typo in units. It was fairly straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> and I think with that, we'll, um, unfortunately, I think we're going to have to draw the episode to a close. I've, uh, thank you for coming on today, Steve. It's been, it's been great talking to you and it's been a really funny episode. There's some brilliant stories and, and it's great to see that, uh, you've kind of not necessarily gone through all of the, uh, the the university way into into getting this job however you've you've made a dream of your own come true with with the lab and, it, and it's going from strength to strength yeah and thanks it, yeah so um yeah the, the thing to sort of clarify there is that the yeah the industrial training um is very similar to an academic training it's just not certified at the end um but to me that was my my dream my passion is following the science and uh, being there on, on the bench, um, and at the at the point as I said, as I set out, I didn't mind uh, whether it was academic or, or industrial. And just the industrial way suited me at the time, and um, yeah, I've never looked back. I mean, to be yeah. fair, you, you have done a postdoc as well. <laughs> yeah, I've done a post, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I just again, I just like to thank you for coming on the show. It's been it's been a great episode, and I think it's going to fit really well with the well, it will fit really well with the theme week that we've got coming on on drug risk, drug discoveries and use of and uses of venoms uh, within that that space and within that market as well. And uh, we would just like to thank our listeners for listening to this episode of this podcast. Please remember, you can listen to all our previous episodes on your preferred podcasting platform. We would love for your feedback and ratings as this allows others to find, listen and share the stories and work of our great guests. Good night and please enjoy this podcast.